Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there students and welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. My name is Crystal Mardukanes, nurse educator, teaching nursing pharmacology. For today's topic, we have drugs affecting the cardiovascular system. But before we proceed to the essential topics on nursing pharmacology related to cardiovascular system drugs, let's first discuss the cardiovascular system. Now we have the structure and function of the heart. So the heart is a hollow muscular organ with four chambers comprising two upper atria and two lower ventricles and it pumps oxygenated blood to the body's cell. So this is mainly the function of the heart. Now we have your card cardiac cycle. We have two steps processes which includes diastole diastole which is the resting phase and systole and systole which is the contraction phase impulses generated in the heart stimulate contraction of the heart muscles so these impulses are very important for the heart to effectively contract and send oxygenated blood to the different parts of the body so the heart conduction system consists of the following patterns or pathways. First, we have the SA node, which is the natural pacemaker of the heart and where the impulses originate. So first, the impulses from the SA node will be transmitted to the AV node or the atrioventricular node. Then after that, it will then be transmitted to the bundle of His. Then after that, it will be transmitted to the bundle branches then lastly it will go to the Purkinje fibers and it will create a strong and effective contraction from the ventricles so that the oxygenated blood will be pumped throughout the body okay so these are the five patterns or pathways of your conduction system in the heart now let's go to your electrocardiography or also known as the ECG. It is the process of recording the patterns of electrical impulses as they move through the heart. So the ECG machine which we use in order to have the ECG reading or tracing is it detects the patterns of electrical impulse generation and conduction through the heart and it translates that information into recorded patterns we call that waveform if we will be looking at the cardiac monitor or a calibrated paper if it is done through ECG machine now let's have the normal ECG waveform so in your ECG tracing or in your ECG or calibrated paper you will see the P wave the QRS complex and the P wave. When we say P wave, it is formed as impulses originating in the SA node or pacemaker pass through the atrial tissue and it also implies atrial contraction. So once you see P wave, it gives you an idea that this is atrial contraction. That means the atrium contracts or the two atria contracts. Then, we have your QRS complex, which represents the polarization of the bundle of His or the Q wave and the ventricles, which, represent, which is represented by your RS waves. When we say depolarization, it is the same as contraction. Okay, So, that means the ventricles contracts in your QRS complex. When we say T wave, it represents repolarization of the ventricles. 
when we say repolarization, it is the same thing as relaxation. That means the ventricle, after contracting, it relaxes. Okay, for in preparation for the next contraction. So once you see T wave on the ECG tracing, that implies ventricular relaxation or repolarization. So these are the three the three normal ECG waveforms that you would see on the ECG tracing or in the calibrated paper. Now we have here the normal sinus rhythm. So once you see an interpretation of normal sinus rhythm, ECG interpretation of normal sinus rhythm, you would note that it is a normal ECG pattern and a heart rate within normal range for that person's age group. For example, for adults, we have 60 to 100 beats per minute as the normal range for heart rate. We also have arrhythmias, or we can call that dysrhythmia. It is a disruption in cardiac rhythm. It is affected by drugs, or maybe a side effects of the drugs, or adverse effects of the drugs. Acidosis, or the acidotic state of the body. Decrease oxygen level, electrolyte changes or imbalances, and waste products. We also have types of arrhythmias. First is we have your sinus arrhythmias. Faster than normal heart rate, more than 100 beats per minute with normal appearing ECG pattern. So once you note this kind of arrhythmia, you would probably classify it as sinus arrhythmia. We also have your supraventricular arrhythmia. So originate above the ventricles but not in the SA node. So when we say supraventricular arrhythmias, the problem actually is on the atria. Because when we say supra, that means it's above the ventricles. Supraventricular, meaning above the ventricles. So the problem is on the atria. And abnormally shaped P wave with normal QRS. So the P wave here is problematic or the P wave here has a problem. Okay. Remember that our P wave indicates atrial contraction. So that means the problem is on the atria. We also have types of supraventricular arrhythmias. First is the premature atrial contraction. It is an ectopic focus in the atria that is generated and that is generating an impulse out of the normal rhythm. Next we have the second category, which is para, parosix, parosismal, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Sporadically occurring runs of rapid heart rate originating in the atria. Also, we have your atrial flutter, which is a sawtooth shaped P waves. So once you see on the wave, uh, on the calibrated paper or, or, or on the ECG tracing, a sawtooth pattern of P wave, you would actually note that it would that it is an atrial flutter tracing, or which is one of the categories of your supraventricular arrhythmia. We also have your atrial fibrillation. This is irregular P wave representing many ectopic foci firing in an uncoordinate, uncoordinated manner through the atria. Okay. We also have your atrioventricular block, which is one type of arrhythmias. It is also called as heart block. It reflects a slowing or lack of conduction at the AV node. Okay. So when we say atrioventricular block, the problem here is on the conduction system of the heart. So the impulses are not properly are not properly transmitted by the, the by that following by the following pathways that we have mentioned on my earlier slides. So we have categories here. First is the first degree block. 
it means that the impulses arrive after a longer than normal period. The impulses are being are delayed to travel or delayed to reach its destination. So it it will take a longer time than the normal or expected period. Second degree heart block, some impulses are lost. So that means impulses are not complete. Lastly, we have your third degree heart block, which is a complete heart block. That means there is no impulses that get through. That means the impulses, the, the conduction system, are not is not really working on this condition. We also have another type of arrhythmia which is ventricular arrhythmias. So impulses that originate below the AV node, it originates from ectopic foci that do not use the normal conduction pathways. So on your, in your ventricular arrhythmias, the problem here is mainly on the ventricles. Now let's define what is circulation. So circulation has two ways or two, uh, there are two mechanisms under the circulation. First is the heart-lung or pulmonary circulation. For the heart-lung or pulmonary circulation, the right side of the heart sends blood to the lungs where carbon dioxide and some waste products are removed from the blood and oxygen is picked up by the RBC. When we say systemic circulation, the left side of the heart sends oxygenated blood out of all the cells in the body. So that means the focus of your heart-lung pulmonary circulation is mainly on the lungs where the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen happens. When we say systemic circulation, this is a circulation that is being, trans that is being done through the uh, being done throughout the uh, different parts of the body. We also have your coronary circulation. The heart muscle requires a constant supply of oxygenated blood to keep contracting. The myocardium receives blood through main through main coronary arteries that branch off the base of the aorta from the sinuses of Valsalba or the crown crowns the heart. So as compared to your systemic circulation which which the, the which is the main function is to supply blood to all, to the different parts of the body here in your coronary circulation the main function or the main purpose of this circulation is to supply blood to the heart muscles. So, in order for our heart muscles to be nourished, blood or there, there must be a circulation of blood on those particular parts. And that is, and that is the function of your coronary circulation. Next, we have your systemic arterial pressure. So, we have here terms like hypotension that means there is a low blood pressure low blood volume or failure of the heart to pump effectively so that would cause also hypotension we also have the opposite which is hypertension it is a constant excessive high blood pressure neurostimulation or increased blood volume vasomotor tone smooth muscles in the walls of arteries which constrict or dilate we also have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or the RAS activated when blood flow to the heart is decreased. So we'll have a detailed discussion on this RAS system. We also have your nat natriuretic peptides. It inhibits the RAS and causes lowering the blood pressure. So these are the conditions under your systemic arterial pressure. Let's define about let's define blood pressure. 
It is maintained by the stimulus from sympathetic system and reflects control of blood volume and pressure. We have here a condition called heart failure. The heart muscles fail to do its job of effectively pumping blood throughout the system. Thus, the blood box up and the system becomes congested. So basically, when we say heart failure, that means the heart could not effectively pump blood going out to the aorta and so that it will be uh, delivered to the different parts of the body. And there is also a buck up of blood to the heart and that would cause congestive heart failure. Now we're done with the concepts about cardiovascular system. Now let's discuss the drugs affecting the blood pressure. First, let's have the drug classifications under your drugs affecting blood pressure. First, we have your drugs affecting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it is classified into three. We have your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and we have your angiotensin 2 receptor blockers and we have your renin inhibitors. Also, we have the calcium channel blocker, we have the vasodilators, diuretic agents, and potassium sparing diuretics, and the sympathetic nervous system drugs. And lastly, we have your anti-hypotensive agents, which is under that is your vasopressors. Now let's have a review of blood pressure controls. So we have three elements. First is the heart rate, second is the stroke volume, and third is the total peripheral resistance. I am sure you know what is heart rate. Let's discuss about the stroke volume instead. Amount of blood that is pumped out of the ventricles with each heartbeat. So that is your stroke volume. When we say to total peripheral resistance, it is the resistance of the mu muscular arteries to the blood being pumped through. Okay, So please be mindful that these are the three elements that you need to know in your blood pressure control. Next, we have your baroreceptors. These are also called as pressure receptors. It is located in the arc of the aorta and in carotid artery. It responds to changes in pressure. For example, if you have high blood pressure, these baroreceptors will be activated to respond to changes in order to balance the pressure within the body. Influences the medulla to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system to increase or decrease the blood pressure. So that means your baroreceptor functions as a buffer or a balancer of the body's blood pressure. Now we have your renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it is a compensatory system when the blood pressure within the kidneys fall and help ensure blood flow in the kidneys maintained. So as what we have mentioned on my earlier slides, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or the RAS is a compensatory mechanism if the body detects that you have a low blood circulating to your kidneys. So this is how RAS or your renin angiotensin, syst angiotensin aldosterone system works. First, if the body detects that there is a low sodium and low blood volume and low blood pressure on the kidney, the angiotensin, the angiotensin, uh, sorry, the angiotensinogen, which is on the liver, which is a Pep, uh, which is a peptide hormone will be converted to angiotensin 1 by the help of your renin which is found on the kidney. Although this angiotensin 1 has, an, has a vasoconstrictor effect but it, it would not be enough to elevate the blood pressure of the patient. So it will further be converted to angiotensin 2 by the help of your angiotensin converting enzyme which is commonly called as ACE 
which is found on the lungs. So now your angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. And remember your angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. That means it is now enough for that hormone or for that substance to be to effect on the body by exhibit by exhibiting vasoconstriction and increasing the aldosterone. So here on my slides, you can see the two effects angiotensin can have. First is vasoconstriction. If, the, if there is a vasoconstriction, there will be an increased peripheral resistance. When, if there is an increased peripheral resistance, there will be an increased blood pressure. Okay, now our low blood pressure problem, which was noted earlier, is now being resolved. Also, your angiotensin 2 has the capability to increase the aldosterone, which is a hormone. If there is an increased aldosterone, it would result to retention of sodium and water by kidneys and intestines. That means our problem about low sodium and low blood volume earlier is now being resolved. So this is how your RAS or your renin angiotensin aldosterone system works as a compensatory mechanism. Now let's proceed to hypertension. What is hypertension? Blood pressure is above normal limits for a sustained period. It is also classified as secondary hypertension and also as essential hypertension. When we say secondary hypertension, high blood pressure with known cause. That means there is an underlying condition or disease why the patient has hypertension. For example, in pheochromocytoma, this is a disease wherein there is a release of large amount of norepinephrine from, from tumor cells on the adrenals. So remember that your adrenals is located above your kidney. So if there is a, and the main function of your adrenals is to produce norepinephrine or epinephrine, which has a sympathetic nervous system properties. That means if you have this norepinephrine or epinephrine, you would have increased blood pressure. So especially if there is an increase or re there is an increased release of large amount of this substance, it could actually elevate your blood pressure severely. So this condition is called your pheochromocytoma. We also have your essential hypertension. It is hypertension with no known cause usually have elevated total peripheral resistance. We also have your hypotension. BP becomes too low. The vital centers in the brain, tissue of the body may not receive enough oxygen. So if there is a prolonged hypertension, hypotension, it would result to shock. So the body is in serious jeopardy as waste products accumulate and cells die from lack of oxygen. Now let's have the causes of hypotension. First, the heart muscle is damaged and unable to pump effectively. For example, in your heart failure. We also have severe blood or fluid loss. Third is extreme stress and the body's levels of norepinephrine are depleted. So these are the main, uh, these are the three causes of hypotension. Now we have here drugs affecting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. One of the body's main reflexes for maintaining BP. So we have three classes. First is the ACE inhibitors or your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Also, we have your ARBs or your angiotensin 2 receptors blockers. Lastly, we have your renin inhibitor. 
So for your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or your ACE inhibitors, we have examples such as captopril or capoten, enalapril, vasotec, lisinopril, prinivil, and peridonpril asian. So it is very easy for you to identify the ACE inhibitors. It usually comes with a pril attachments or pril words on the drug name. The therapeutic actions and indications are it acts in the lungs to prevent ACE from converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 which is a powerful vasoconstrictor and stimulator of aldosterone release. So that means it inhibits the ACE inhibitors. Uh, it, it inhibits the ACE to convert the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. We also have your contraindications and cautions. So first, presence of allergy to the medication, impaired renal function, heart failure, salt or volume depletion, childbearing age mother, and pregnancy and lactation. So these are the contraindications in taking that medication. We also have adverse effects. For your CNS or your central nervous system, it causes syncope, dizziness, and headache. For your skin or your for your dermatological affectation, we have your alopecia and rash. We also have cough. For your cardiovascular effects, we have tachycardia, heart failure, arrhythmias, hypotension. It could also cause liver damage and renal damage, such as proteinuria and renal failure. For your GI effects, we have constipation and GI upset. For your genitourinary effects, we have loss of libido. Now let's proceed to your angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Examples are Candisartan, Atacand, Herbisartan, Avapro, Lusartan, Kozar, Olmisartan, Benicar, Telmisartan, Micardis, Valsartan, Jovan. So again, it is very easy to identify your angiotensin 2 receptor blockers because there is a Sartan word which is attached to that drug name. The therapeutic action and indications. So it selectively binds with angiotensin 2 receptors in vascular smooth muscles and in the adrenal cortex to block vasoconstriction and release of aldosterone. So basically, it blocks the receptors of angiotensin 2 in order to inhibit its function. However, there are contraindications and cautions for this medication. Presence of allergy, we also have your hepatic or renal dysfunction, hypovolemia, pregnancy, and lactation. For the adverse effect, we have dizziness headache, diarrhea, abdominal pain, symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection, cough, back pain, fever, muscle weakness, and hypotension. So these are the adverse effects of the medication. Next, we have your renin inhibitor. For example, your aliskerin or tecturna. It is a new drug classification which inhibits renin, leading to decreased plasma renin activity and inhibiting the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So this is the main function of your renin inhibitor. However, we have contraindications and cautions for taking renin. First, we have the pregnancy, breastfeeding, and hyperkalemia. When we say hyperkalemia, there is an increased potassium on the blood. Next, let's have another drug classification which is calcium channel blocker. So it, is, it decreases blood pressure, cardiac workload, and myocardial 
gin consumption. Examples are Amlodipine or your Norvast, Philodipine, Plendil, Nicardipine, Cardin, Cardin, Dilchesem, Cardizem CB, Nifidipine, Procardia XL, Verapamil Calan SR. So it's very easy for you to identify the calcium channel blockers by just looking their drug names. Usually, the, usually they have the pins on their drug names. The therapeutic actions and indications of calcium channel blocker is it inhibits the movement of calcium ions across the membranes of myocardial and arterial blood cells, altering the actions, potential, and blocking muscle cell contractions. So basically, your calcium channel blockers functions by relaxing the heart muscles. Okay, So that is the main action of your calcium channel blockers. It relaxes the cardiac muscles. Contraindications and cautions. Presence of, art, of allergy, heart block, renal and hepatic dysfunction, pregnancy, lactation. For the adverse effects of your calcium channel blocker, we have dizziness, lightheadedness, headache, peripheral edema, bradycardia, atrioventricular block, flushing, and nausea. We also have vasodilators, reserved for use in severe hypertension, malignant hypertension, or hypertensive emergencies. So examples are hydralazine, minoxidil, nitropyricide, or nitropress. For the therapeutic action and indication of this medication, it, medication it acts directly on vascular smooth muscle to cause muscle relaxation, leading to vasodilation and drop in blood pressure. It is indicated for treatment of severe hypertension that has not responded to the other therapy. So this means that it widens the blood pressure to accommodate more blood on that blood vessels. For the contraindications and cautions, we have known allergies, cerebral insufficiency, peripheral vascular disease or your PVD, coronary artery disease or your CAD, heart failure, tachycardia, pregnancy, and lactation. Now let's have another drug classification which is diuretic. Drugs that increase the excretion of sodium and water from the kidney. It is the first agent trialed in mild, hyper, in mild hypertension. So we have here examples of your diuretic agents. We have the thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics and also a potassium-sparing diuretics. So examples of your thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics are chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, methyl, methyl chlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, indapamine, metolazole. So it's very easy for you to actually identify this medication because the name, the drug name, thiazide is being attached on each medication. We also have your potassium sparing diuretics, amyloride, spironolactone, and triamterin. For the adverse effects of diuretics, we have apprehension, headache, retrosternal pressure, palpitations, cyanide toxicity, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and irritation at the injection site if the medication is given parenterally. Now let's have the sympathetic nervous system blockers. Drugs that block the effects of the sympathetic nervous system are useful in blocking many of the compensatory effects of the 
sympathetic nervous system. We also have here classifications such as beta blockers, alpha and beta blockers, alpha adrenergic blockers, alpha blockers, and alpha agonists. So before that, we have here uh, we have here the difference between the parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. So your parasympathetic responses, the following responses are it constricts pupil, stimulates salivation, slows heart rate, constricts bronchi, stimulates digestion, stimulates bile release, stimulates peristalsis and secretion, and contracts bladder. For your sympathetic responses, we have it dilates pupil, inhibit salivation, dilate bronchi, accelerates heartbeat, inhibits digestion, stimulates glucose release, stimulates epinephrine and norepinephrine release, inhibits peristalsis and secretion, and relaxes the bladder. So when we say parasympathetic responses, just remember rest and digest. So meaning the body is the body is on a resting phase but the GI functions. There is an increased functions function of your GI or your gastrointestinal system. However, on your sympathetic nervous system, it is a flight and flight fight and flight response. That means all functions are increased here. Okay? So that is the main difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. Now let's proceed to beta blockers. It blocks vasoconstriction, decreases heart rate, decreases cardiac muscle contraction, and tends to increase blood flow to the kidneys, leading to a decrease in the release of renin. So examples of your beta blockers are Atenolol, metoprolol, nevevolol, propanolol, and timolol. So it's very easy to identify the drugs based on their drug names. It is usually accompanied by lol. Next, we have your alpha and beta blockers. It tends to be more powerful vasodilator. It blocks, it blocks all the receptors in the sympathetic system. For example, your carvidilol, Coreg, and your labitalol, Trandate. Okay. So it's more powerful because it does not just block the beta receptors but as well as the alpha receptors. Now let's have your alpha adrenergic blockers. It inhibits the post synaptic alpha adrenergic receptors, decreasing sympathetic tone in the vasculature and causing vasodilation. Examples are phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine. We also have your alpha-1 blockers. Blocks the postsynaptic alpha-1 receptor sites. It decreases the vascular tone and promotes vasodilation. And examples are praxosine, menipres, terazine, sorry, terazosine. Now we have also your alpha-2 agonist. Stimulates the alpha-2 receptors in the CNS which inhibit sympathetic activity. Also, it inhibits the cardiovascular centers, central and peripheral system, leading to lower blood pressure. Examples are clonidine or catapress and methyl dopa. Now, let's have your anti-hypotensive agents. If we have medication that prevents the hypertension or that uh, lowers the hyper that or lowers the blood pressure we also have your anti hypotension agents that means this increases the blood pressure 
we have your sympathetic adrenergic agonist or vasopressors. It is the first choice for treating severe hypotension or shock. Examples are dobutamine, dopamine, ephedrine, epinephrine or adrenaline, isoproterenol or isopril, norepinephrine or your levofed, phenylephrine. We also have your sympathomimetic drugs. React with sympathetic adrenergic receptors to cause the effects of a sympathetic stress response such as increased blood pressure it also increases blood volume and increase the cardiac muscle contractions when we say sympathomimetic drugs it mimics or it uh, it follows the responses of your sympathetic nervous system response.